started. <laughs> All right, we are on. This is Stacy Krim and David Gwynn doing an oral history with Dirk Robertson and James Sands for the Pride of the Community project. Today is June 1st, 2019. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you for coming to hear us. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you both uh, end up in the triad? Uh, I'll go first, I guess, on that one. I grew up in Statesville myself, which is on down I-40. And, um, yeah, it was sort of a, a process for me to end up in the Winston community. I had driven to Winston, obviously, as a child with my family and knew the city some that way. And I went to the undergrad at UNC Greensboro. But uh, living in Statesville, though, as an adult, and when I came out as gay in the year, about the year 2000, I was equidistant between Winston and Charlotte. So it was sort of a, I first went to Charlotte my first year because my thinking was, well, bigger city, more opportunities maybe, you know, just to meet more people or whatever. And so I went to Charlotte first year and, and it was a nice experience and I have some stories I can relate later on about that. But um, I never did find it quite a good fit for me. And then I met, I got to try a private men's course because uh, I'm a musician and, uh, and, I, and I knew right then when I came to the Triad Pride Men's Course that I had found a family that was something I could identify with. There were like 24 guys in the course at that time that were my age, a little bit younger, a little bit older, but had you know similar things in common. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I knew then it, that I eventually I'd be a part of this community and come live here and stuff. But James can talk about growing up in North Winston. He's sort of always been here. Pretty much. Yeah, I was born born in Winston and grew up here and went to high school here and didn't even leave for college, went to Wake Forest. Um, my family's originally from Stokes County. Uh, my first real career job was working for the uh, King Public Library. Uh, and eventually in 99, I took a position with the Forsyth County Public Library downtown. I've worked for them ever since and so I hope to retire in five more years or so. Uh, but my coming out journey, uh, we basically came out, I think about the same age, mm -hmm. which in my case was when I, about 36, when I decided, when I started working for the Forsyth County Public Library. And that's and not uncommon really though. We have several, not. yeah, we have a lot of our friends. generation. For our generation, because yeah, I mean the 80s and 90s were quite impressive, in North Carolina especially. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's not uncommon. Um, and my supervisor, uh, when I worked downtown, um, uh, was an out gay man. The first one I had really gotten to know well. And so in the process of just getting to know him and, um, getting more comfortable with myself and talking to him over a, a year or so, uh, I got comfortable with the fact that, uh, I could probably just finally just come on out. Uh, and I came out to my family. Um, it, it was a little touch and go. It took a little while for my parents to come to terms with that. But, uh, um, my mom passed away in 2010 and by that point we were, you know, all, all good. And, um, uh, but I'm still very close to my family. Um, and I started going to MCC church here in Winston, 2001. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was part of my journey was I had my own internal religious struggle as a lot of us have uh, and going to MCC and and getting to know the, these people really helped me in my journey and just to get comfortable with being an out gay Christian. And can you and, tell us what MCC stands for? Uh, the Metropolitan Community Church. Is Jim considered the leading LGBT religious organization? I mean, obviously there are many religions that affiliate with the LGBT community, but that was probably founded by gays. And, mm -hmm. I know. think in maybe like 1970 or something, yeah. it dates back that far. And um, so they were a huge, huge help in, in my journey and coming to terms with myself. And I made a, a lot of good friends who are still my friends through that church. And um, eventually met Dirk through one of my friends. Uh, at a uh, party, I think it was a Christmas party, mm -hmm. uh, that I attended with uh, my friend Rick Service Sugar. benefit, I yeah. think New Year's Eve. Or maybe was, yeah. Yeah. And, and for, that's where I first met Dirk, and we just got to be... We had seen each other a couple of gatherings, and I yeah. knew him from the library when I'd go and patronize the Louisville Library, but, uh, but yeah, that was our first official contact. So we just got to be friends through that, and 
that just sort of developed and blossomed over the years, and here we are. I used the men's tours to come out to my parents. Uh, of course, like his mother, my mother sort of already knew right, but uh, still, I, I, yeah, I had joined the men's course in 2002, and at the beginning of that year, and I wanted them to come to the Christmas concert that year. And so I told my parents, like, I want you to come see this course. But I said, it's a special group. It's a special family. And I want you to come see this concert, and we can talk about what you're going to see here. Our course is not a – men's courses can be very different. Some of them can be very demonstrative and sing very <laughs> risque songs. And, and our course never has been too much of that. But we usually do a couple of little fun, campy things. And so and my parents came, and then the concert, we sang this one song about the three gay wise men going to the manger, and they had on chiffon and taffeta, and, and it was a fun, cute song. And, well, when we got done with that song and had the intermission, I uh, went back on stage, and my dad wasn't in the audience, and it really freaked me out. I'm like, oh, my gosh, is my dad, like, forsaking me? Is he freaking out because of, the, you know, the song or something? And, uh, and I was about to get really upset. I was like, you know, okay, I got to get together. I got to get to this concert and put it out of my mind. But after I went to my friends backstage, I said, where did my dad go? Why didn't he come back in after intermission? He said he was eating cookies in the lobby. It's like, oh, that sounds like my dad. <laughs> so it really wasn't that. But, but like James, it was a little bit of an issue after that. I was like, I wasn't sure if my dad for a while was going to come to our wedding. He was, a, he was a little nervous about us getting married at Wake Chapel at Wake Forest. But uh, he came around. My dad that my dad put his family first. Even though I, uh, the idea of gay marriage was sort of hard for him at first. It was uh he came around and he and then and he he loves his two sons and so so we uh, we felt blessed to have him there but uh, but that was a that was an interesting moment of that and uh, and and talk about uh, both of us coming out of the age of thirty five uh, that that's fascinating I say it's not uncommon in our uh, group but how you react to it it can be very different now I have a friend that also came out that age and he felt like he threw his whole youth away and he really regrets coming out that late. Because, as you know, we're quite a youth-obsessed, looks-obsessed culture. <laughs> and, you know, you can look at TV and know that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, so, like, he felt like, you know, I threw away my, my youth. I could have been going to circuit parties and all this kind of thing. And, you know, here I'm, I wasted all this time. But we didn't really feel that way. We felt like our life was a process. And in some ways, we were sort of grateful about it because we didn't have to deal with the whole AIDS crisis of the 80s and 90s. I mean, we certainly was aware of it. We had compassion for it, but we weren't, like, making friends and losing friends in death. In fact, I dated a, my first boyfriend uh, that I dated several times was a DJ in Charlotte, and he was a little bit older than me. And he knew about the entire Charlotte community through the gay bars and stuff. And he said at one moment of time in the late 80s, um, he went to an average of eight funerals a month for four straight months. He went to like 32 funerals in four months. That's a lot of grieving. And I just I just told James when I met him and relayed that story, it's like, I'm just so grateful. I didn't have to, you know, do, do that. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, yeah, I, when I came out to that, I met friends who were HIV positive in the course. And I, you know, and I've worked for AIDS care services for six years on their board before they closed. And, and you know, I've worked and shown compassion and been involved in it. But I'm just grateful I didn't have to lose really close friends that I, you know, to the death. So that was a that was a, a blessing for that, but uh, but yeah, I, I don't regret uh, coming out. I did go do one circuit party. I don't think James ever been to a circuit party, but I did go do one because I had a friend that was into that. And when I talk about circuit parties, what I mean is like a lot of gays that love to party, and and a lot of times it involves recreational drugs, but it doesn't have to. But it's uh, but yeah, they'll get together at various points. There's like the white party in Miami, and you hear about Palm Springs party. You probably have heard of that in culture, and and there's uh, Abracadabra. And I went to the one in Pensacola on Memorial Day weekend. There's a big one, or used to be, down in Mount Pensacola, Florida, and I met my friend there. And I told James, I said, that was, I, I really felt like every gay man at that point in time, especially in North Carolina, should be required to do one of those. Even if you're not into dancing and the dressing, just to see the amount of people. I mean, because when you grow up like in Statesville or in Stokes County or North, you know, you just feel so isolated. It's like, you know, I'm this very unusual person. You know, you see it in the news, but you feel so like you're an island. But yeah, to go to like a circuit party, see like literally 250,000 LGBT members like aligning a beach as far as I can see. I mean, it was really eye-opening and just amazing to be in that. So, yeah, it was the only one I did because I'm not part of that drug culture or anything. So I never went to another one, but I was really glad I went to the one I went to mm -hmm. to just experience that. So mm -hmm. that's our prehistory on a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't out during the AIDS crisis, but you were probably in high school um, or college. Yeah, we both graduated in 83. Um, do you remember kind of what the climate would have been like? Or do you remember yeah, any Well, incidents? yes. Uh, 
I had um, two gay first cousins who were quite a bit older than me, and I didn't really know them that well. Um, uh, Danny lived in Atlanta, uh, and I, I, I knew he was gay, and it was sort of whispered about and talked about in my family and everything as something to be ashamed of and kept quiet and um, growing up sort of hearing that didn't exactly help me accept my own sexuality. Uh, and in 1985, when I was still in college, uh, he came back to town for the funeral of my great aunt. And I could tell at that point that he was sick. I didn't know what exactly at that point, but a year later he died and it was, you know, discussed in the family uh, he, that he had AIDS and everything. And it was finally, you know, confirmed maybe a year or so after that. And I just remember thinking, well, if this is what it means to be gay and this is how you end up, I just don't want any part of that. You know, I'm just going to shut that part of myself off and just pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, so that was, that certainly kept me in the closet through my 20s anyway. Um, but that's really the most personal and only, you know, closest um experience I had with AIDS and it was just all something very hush hush and to be something to be ashamed of and it was just something I just thought well I just don't want anything to do with that so that was my personal experience of that my only experience I don't I don't know if I ever told James this but I didn't know this person but I'm a I'm a lifelong Methodist I'm a Methodist choir director um we can talk about that because it's been a hard year I've been in grieving over the ruling oh, this year that the Methodists right. did and I can refer to that but um but yeah I was I was a uh, I had just been appointed this Methodist church uh, to direct them. This was about 1995. And um, and when I, you know, I was just getting to know the people and I had a lot of nice people in my car, but this is a small country church in Claremont, North Carolina. And uh, and one of the altos, um, uh, I didn't know this, but I had, I, generally uh, for a small country church, I like to use the, the song I'll Fly Away as like an icebreaker to get to know the choir because it's usually something every little small country church loves. It's a very peppy song. And, and so I said, hey, let's sing I'll Fly Away together before we break up and we'll probably do it in church in a couple of weeks. And we started singing it and the salto just started bawling and left the room. And it really freaked me out. Like, you know, I never had that reaction before. And I, was, and I told the, and I actually, after we got to the end of the verses, stopped. And I told the, I said, did I do something wrong? I said, I said, she had just lost her son to AIDS. And they played that song at his funeral. Mm -hmm. And that just really brought it all back up to her. And I just like. You never told me that. Yeah, I didn't think I ever told you that story. But yeah, I really, that was really the, about my main experience with something like that. Just, uh, just as I didn't know him. Well, I did meet him brief. Oh, I met his partner once yeah he had died before when i got but his partner came to the church at christmas just i think i think his mother wanted him to meet me just to just to sort of make a connection there or something so um but it was um you know it was uh it was hard on her and uh and yeah that was the only only person i knew really that was going through that at the time but i say the time that we both came out uh you know the thankfully you know the 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 medicines and things were in that had come along that you know people are HIV positive it wasn't a death sentence and and so, yeah, that was the only one that I, I knew of. I mean, we lost a couple of friends. I knew were HIV positive. It wasn't necessarily, I don't think, AIDS-related that they died. But, but um. well, another, another little personal experience that happened to me, not AIDS-related, but in the, in the 80s, when I first started working at the library, I had a coworker who was a part-time minister, an older fellow, and had a son, I think, in his 20s. And we had a, a fairly regular customer that would come into the library in King that he, we knew he was gay. It was pretty obvious. And he had come in one time and, and we checked him out or whatever. And after he left, I was shelving in the stacks and I heard my two coworkers talking about him in not very complimentary terms. And the, the, my fellow coworker, he was talking about, well, I heard him say this. He said, well, if I found out my son was gay, I'd take him out in the field and shoot him. Mm. Well, that leaves an impression on a 20-something who's mm. struggling with his own sexuality. So that was another thing that pushed me even further back into the closet. Mm. So the 80s were not necessarily a pleasant time for me in some ways. So um, I don't know if you ever heard anything like that said 
around you or not. Well, we're just lucky. We both feel like we had family support and never right. dealt with the whole, you know, exile from your home thing. I mean, we, we knew several people had, in the bowling league I founded. I had two uh, guys who, who were both homeless and found each other that way and they were kicked out of their homes. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's sort of why we sort of fight to do all we've done and be active in the community and make ourselves visible and try to normalize this because, you know, that's still a real problem for a lot, a lot of kids, you know, especially if you're growing up some devout religious home that's very anti-LGBT. I mean, there's still a lot of kids get kicked out of their homes and and uh, we want to sort of stop that process. I mean, there's just no reason for that. And it's no excuse, but it's, it still sadly goes on a lot today. But, um, yeah, the experiences of, of how it was back then, it just, it's, amazing to see it progress because we've 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 experienced what we've experienced and seen how hard it was to but yeah how easier it is today and how it keeps getting easier but uh i did meet one couple when i was at fort lauderdale visiting some friends and i met this older couple and they had met each other in pittsburgh in 1964 i said how did you even find each other in 1964 i just couldn't imagine you know because you know i could imagine how i know how hard it was in the 80s and 90s and i just thought i couldn't imagine how did you and he said Whenever you went to the big cities, any big city, you'd go to the fanciest hotel and you would uh, go to the bellhop and discreetly go ask the bellhop, I need a special club for gentlemen only. And the bellhop said, uh, I know what you want. Uh, you need to go like three or four blocks down this way and take a ride. Then you'll take a left. You'll see this alley door. There'll be a special marking on it. And you'll knock four times and they'll let you in. I mean, that's what it was. That's how you met. I mean, you know, and, and yeah, just that we've gone from that world in the 60s to what we have today is just amazing. I mean, especially in the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. And that's yeah. just, uh, that story just really resonated me uh, ever since I learned that. And can you speak a bit about Stonewall and what it meant to you? Well, uh, I visited Stonewall for the first time myself back in 2004. I had a, a good friend who who's a musician here. We went to stay with a friend of his who directs the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Opera and, uh, in New York City. And we he, and that's one of the first things I want to do is go see Stonewall. And, uh, and I actually got to speak to the bar, bartender. They called him Tree. Uh, he was about maybe a few inches taller than you and uh, very similar. Uh, and uh, he um, and they called him Tree. And he was there that night. He, was, he had just gotten, he was hired, I think, that spring before the, the whole riots happened stuff. So he, I got a personal account from this uh, guy and uh, I don't know if he's I'm sure he's retired probably from that bar but I don't know if he's still alive or not but uh they sort of really amazing to to not only be there but to hear an account from somebody mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, talked about the actual rights today but yeah it's uh, something that is, is like one of the first things I learned about and I just hope the youth today you know stay aware of our history and realize the importance of that because um you know, I just to me that's where the our that's where our, our gay movement started. I mean, I just you know, there was obviously gay communities before then and everything, but that was the first big pushback and the big organized effort and pride parades came out of that and and yeah, it was just uh, it, was, it was very important and so important. I mean, the men's chorus just did a, a big uh, 50th anniversary celebration. They commissioned a big work about the Stonewall riots, and we they performed that. Uh, I didn't get to perform. I went to watch them because I took a semester off, but uh, but it was really moving. <laughs> performance uh, that they put uh, did together with the Triangle Gay Men's Course and the other women's course in, in Durham and uh, did a big mass choir to uh, to commemorate that and it was really really amazing and we're going to Galen we're going next summer to to Gala. that's when all the courses get together and that's an amazing week of music and it's in Minneapolis this coming summer we're looking forward to that because neither one of us ever been to Minnesota but I well imagine there's going to be a lot of Stonewall probably music and celebrations because mm -hmm. right on the eve of this I'm sure a lot of the gay men courses and stuff are celebrating that so it, it, it's amazing to me how much courage it took just to go to a bar back at that point, I mean, and having to worry about raids every night and ending up in jail or something like that, but uh, it's my own experience of going to any kind of a, a gay club came rather late in life, and I would always usually just go with friends. Um, I mean, it was mostly hard for us to the first time, out, first time, and we were we were worried about being raided or anything. I mean, yeah. so we could imagine yeah. what they was going through in the sixties, just, you know? just in whatever that was. I mean, my first time going to a gay bar was nerve wracking and not, not having to work, worry about getting arrested. So I, I can't imagine what it was like back then. But um, uh, yeah, there aren't there aren't that many around locally anymore yeah it's just uh, um, that's, that's a good and bad thing i mean on one hand i'm grateful that things have been more normalized that there are so many more avenues and 
means for young gay people to find each other and they don't have to necessarily do the whole bar scene especially if you're not into that which neither of us have been into the social drinking part James loves to dance but yeah, but, uh, but the uh, yeah the yeah the, the whole so generally I, I wasn't too big on bar scene when I go to the bars in Charlotte I just go like between 10 and midnight I mean a gay bar I'm sure it's still this way really doesn't start till midnight on the weekends and, and I, I mean being a school person as a school, school teacher with the children's library it's like I, get, I go to bed pretty early get up or I was like you know it just wasn't but so what I do is I'd go like between 10 and midnight and talk to the bartenders talk to people that would sit at the bars and then yeah when midnight pretty much the place goes dark and they crank up the music stuff and then I'd probably be out of there uh, you know pretty quickly after that so that's my my MO for, for what I did with the bars but it was um, yeah it was a whole different thing I actually actually the first time I ended up there was a, a club here in Winston called the Power Company and when I was in college and not out some somehow we I ended up there with a group of straight friends uh, first time I'd ever been in that kind of a scene before and I thought oh gosh guys dancing with guys girls dancing with girls this is kind of neat actually but that yeah I never have forgotten that first experience but there again I was just totally closeted so it was a uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they. Uh, I, it was so hard for me. I mean, uh, back then they had cover. You had to pay membership fees, like you pay twenty or thirty a year to be a member of this bar to be able to get in. You know, without covers and stuff. And or they wouldn't let you in at all unless you was a member. And yeah, this new bar it was a new hot bar in Charlotte, and I wanted. That was my first bar experience, and I wanted to be a part of it. But yet the the practical side of me didn't want to pay this. Thirty dollar membership, then end up, you know, not wanting to be a part, you know, freaking out and not using it stuff. So I told the doorman, I said, I said, you know, I'm I'm going to be honest with you. I said, I know it's hard to believe at my age, but I said this is my very first experience. I said I'd like to come in and check this out for a while, but I don't really want to pay a membership because I really don't know if this is for me. And he and he said, well, we have rules and stuff. And he said, I'll sign you as my guest tonight, and you know that's all, and don't worry about it and stuff. So, um, so I went in and I had a good time. I just sat there for the bar and met a couple of guys and just talked for a while and talked to a friendly bartender and and enjoyed what little I did and stuff. So yeah, I was so grateful for that. I went out the next during the to belt the next week and bought this this uh, the doorman a uh, 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 Calvin Klein cologne set <laughs> and took it to him and I said I want to I said I want to give you this I said it just meant the world to me. I mean, you know, it costs two or three times more than the membership fee, but it just meant so much to me that he he gave me that chance, and, you know, to help ease me into it. Because yeah, I mean, had he, had he been very defiant or a little rough with me, I might I might have walked away and never done anything. And so, so that was my my experience with that. And it was a, yeah, it's was, it was still a hard uh, time stuff. But, but what really motivated me to do it was uh, uh, was the TV show Queer as Folk when it aired on Showtime. I think it aired that December two thousand because I remember I built my, I bought a house in Statesville. And I set up a nice home, and I had a good life. I mean, it was, it was not a gay life, but I had good friends, and I was into sports. I was fit then, and doing volleyball and softball and all this fun stuff. But, but I still knew those. I wasn't living my truth, and that was a big part of my life that was missing. And, um, and yeah, I remember Showtime era queers folk, and I thought, well, center, something checks out. And just what a shocking! You know, I don't know if you've ever seen an episode of, it, but it was a shock just to yeah. see that. And yeah, even though there was a lot of that show that I, you know, we don't identify with in our life and how we, because again, there's a lot of drug culture in that show and stuff. But even so, but I realized watching the show is like, there's a whole world out there I'm denying myself that I'm just sort of, you know, and that's sort of why I was like, I've got to start traveling Charlotte or States, Winston or something and, you know, just see, you know, just uh, check out things. So and that started me on my journey. It was just like, uh, I'm grateful for it, that's for sure. What other clubs in the area did you attend? I, I say when I did my bar home, it's mainly the two or three down in Charlotte. Uh, I went to Odyssey a few times, um, both when I came that, at that point in time. I say I quick did most of it. But once I found the men's course, I generally was, I'd say I never was a bar person anymore because I'm more a social talker and wasn't a heavy social drinker. And I just, so I, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't do too much bar, but I did go to Odyssey a few times. And But I, having said that, I'd say I'm still sort of sad that the bar, there's not a bar available for 
for people to have visited in Winston because, I mean, it was such an important part of how we found each other. I mean, we just did, you know, heterosexuals just take for granted. I mean, they have so many avenues back then, especially of where they could meet people. You know, you had your churches and you had all these social groups and you had all this. I mean, it just wasn't, you know, just anywhere you went like that. We didn't really have that luxury. It's like you had to be sort of careful about who you talked to, who you knew. And, and yeah, the, the bar was the one place you could go. You knew, you knew what it was there for. And you could either, if you were interested in one night stands, you could find that. If you didn't want to find a part, Partner, life partner, you could go find that, and it was the main thing. And so, and I say I'm grateful we have all these groups and have social websites and things now. But uh, sort of, sort of regret that we're losing the the contact. You know, the, the where it all started. Sort of, I don't know. Um, I, I when I went to the few times I went to the club over the years, we usually went to the warehouse in Greensboro, which I think that's finally that shut down a while uh, back. I think. I think. So. Yeah. Three or um, four years ago. Yeah, 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 but it would usually just be three or four of us. Um, we mainly just went to dance and drink a beer or something. It was actually pretty innocent as that yeah. kind of thing went, but uh, um, that was the main place I went because I really didn't like the Odyssey here in Winston that much, and um, there really wasn't a whole lot of choice. I never... Well, I did go when my friend uh, Richard lived in um, Raleigh for a few about four years. When I go visit him, we'd go to some of the Raleigh clubs just to hang out while while I was there. Uh, but there really never was anything I much cared for in Winston. Uh, I don't know why that was. Whether it just wasn't enough to support it or or what, but. Not really sure. Well, beyond like beyond the dancing, you just wasn't too yeah. much there for you. You didn't really no, care to socially drink. No. It was loud. You don't like loud things, and so, yeah. uh, so and they yeah. were too loud. <laughs> yeah, I mean the music could just be deafening. I was yeah. like, how, how they have. I Even when I was younger, I didn't much like it. I was like, that could, that could yeah. just turn this down. There's a lot of tired. older gay DJs with a lot of hearing impairments, yeah. I imagine. So. Yeah. So I don't I don't need yeah. a second heartbeat, so yeah, yeah I just turn that a little bit. And then everything yeah. would yeah. stop for the drag yeah. show. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so it was, it was uh, that's what I felt about it. But, yeah, and, and talk about your behaviors and how you were. About, even today, like, you know, as free as things are today, I mean, you, uh, you know, we have to be mindful of the how to, um, you know, how... I think you still have, even Winston, I mean, you have to be mindful stuff. I mean, we never have been much in, for PDA anyway. I mean, we're sort of a little more private than that. But, uh, but I, um, but it's so, but even so, yeah, I imagine, you know, in Winston, you know, it'd be, you know, not, I don't know too many of our friends that choose to walk hand in hand down the street in Winston like some, really. like a heterosexual couple do. Now, like, if we go to Apture, I'll put my arm around James like he's my husband and, and I'll rub his shoulder stuff, and I feel comfortable with places like the Aperture doing things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, but I'm a little pretty brash anyway. I just and I'll never forget that same DJ I first dated in Charlotte. When we went out on a date around 2001 in Charlotte. I said, I just want you to know that I'm I'm new to all this. I said, if I do something that's not safe, you know, let me know. I mean, because I, I, I he said I wish somebody would say something to me. He was that kind of person. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I just knew it 2001. You know, that's some you know, that another time ago and I was I, and so I wasn't I didn't want to do something you know, I don't want to grab his hand or do something that would that would like get us attacked or something so I was, I was a little mindful of that because knowing how I'm because I'm pretty demonstrative as an extroverted kind of person anyway so yeah, I have to be aware of that too so. um, can we talk a bit about the process of you both coming out in 2000 2001 um, and, and when you made that that decision yeah as as I was saying earlier I that process for me really got started getting to know my friend Billy who was my supervisor down at the library and just getting to know an out gay man who was comfortable with himself and just lived his life and I mean he didn't talk about his private life like broadcaster or anything but everyone knew and you know no one seemed to care so that I thought okay well that's well, that's that's nice. Maybe maybe I can just open up and live my life and not worry about it. And um, also, I it through um, I started going to uh, P Flag. So I want to give a shout out to P Flag. Um, they met. They have, uh, the local chapter met in the church next to the apartment I lived in at the time down in Winston. And so when I was starting to think about coming out, I thought, well, I might as well take advantage of this group who's just meeting right here at me. Um, and so I really got 
heavily involved with PFLAG and meeting all those people and everything was a huge eye-opener and source of comfort for me. And actually, that's how I got started going to uh, Metropolitan Community Church because one of my friends there went there and said, well, you know, if you're interested in, uh, still interested in going to church, which I, I was, I've always been a Christian. Um, and so it was nice to feel like I could still be one. <laughs> um, and so that, between those two things, uh, that's what really got me. And then my friend Billy's like, well, I really think you, you should just come on out to your, your family and, and um, your, you know, and I'm, yeah, that, I came out to my, my mom first and my brother. My brother was fine with it. Um, he's seven years older than me and we were always close and he's like, well, you're my brother and I love you. It doesn't matter to me. And that was all that was for that. My mother had a much more difficult time with it as I'm sure that happens quite often. Um, but uh, eventually she figured out I was the same person I always was. And I told her right off, I said, Mom, it's nothing, it's nothing you did or didn't do in your, in your raising of me. You raised me and my brother the exact same way, and he's straight and I'm gay, and that's, it just is what it is. And eventually she just sort of figured out that I, I, didn't, I didn't turn into this stranger just because I came out to her. I was just the same son she'd always known and loved, and over the years she just got more and more comfortable with it. And she passed away in 2010, and at that point we were totally good with each other. Um, and actually, at least formally, I didn't come out to my dad formally <laughs> until a little while before we, just after we got engaged. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to invite my father to my wedding, it might be nice if I come out to him first, finally, officially. My father, if he does the abroad, come down that aisle. Um, <laughs> But that was a much easier situation. Well, my dad was elderly at that point. At that point, he was still in good health. Um, and I just went up and visited one day when my, and, um, and just sat him down and I just told him the situation. I said, uh, Dad, I'm gay and I'm engaged to Dirk, who I think he'd already met, you know, he'd already met you at that point. Um, but not as, I didn't introduce him as my fiance or boyfriend or anything, but uh, and he was like, well, you know, James, I pretty much already knew that. <laughs> and he said, you know, at my age, nothing shocks me anymore. He said, as long as you're happy, I'm happy for you. And that was pretty much that. I thought, wow, that was easy. And here I had myself all tied up in knots, you know, wondering how he was going to react. And it was just, okay. And so he had no problem coming to our, officially coming to our wedding and everything. And then it was a bit more of a process for his father, but anyway. Um, yeah, my dad, well, I say my dad and my, at the end of the day loves me. My dad, my dad's very, my mom and dad both were huge community servants, huge nonprofit. I mean, there wasn't a bell, Salvation Army bell we didn't ring in Iredell County. I mean, Fifth Street Ministries, homeless shelters, Thanksgiving, all of it. My parents were all about that. But along with that, my dad really worried what everybody else thought, you know, like, oh, what will people think about this? And so, yeah, that's, I think, the biggest part. I don't, I, you know, my dad worried a little bit about my, my, you know, my religious future. I mean, like, am I going to hell because I'm this person or something? I mean, he, he worried about that. But, but I think it, he was just other, more worried about what would other people think. And, and yeah, it was, uh, it was a little bit of process of the wedding. I mean, because I knew, I knew, we weren't sure. We went through a whole process of, like, how to get married. And I really want to get married, because I mentioned I'm a life on Methodist. So I really want to get married in Methodist Church. I knew I couldn't have an official wedding in the Methodist Church. I knew that this was three or four years ago, but even before the ruling was past spring. But but so but I, I told James, I said, well, you know, I can we can do the vows at the courthouse. I said, and I'm a musician. I said, for me, it's more about getting friends together for some music and poetry reading, and then just having a love like a love ceremony, not a marriage. So I went to the district superintendent, which is what we call the leader of a Methodist group. We're organized that way, and I went to the district superintendent because I thought I want to get. I want to know what he'll do first before I even try to approach any church I'm going to. So I went to District Town. I said, well, this is what I want to do. And he said, as long as you don't do any vows, as long as uh, you don't ask the minister to minister any vows, all he can do is read scripture. And as long as it doesn't look like a wedding, um, uh, in other words, I can't have, uh, you know, this, you know, the, the uh, just typical wedding 
decorations or something. Well, I was okay with all that because uh, I love Christmas. And I told James, you know, I really love a Christmas wedding. Well, the church is already decorated Christmas. They have a Christmas tree and all the, dec you know, the Christmas decorations. So I was like, I don't need to decorate. You know, I can just. So I said, no, I, I think I can comply with all this. You know, and that's right. he said, well, I think we could sign off on that. So then I went to the, the minister I was going to uh, at First United Methodist in Monson, which is a conservative. And I knew Dade County was a conservative area. But the reason I was going there was I was fired from being a Methodist gay choir director from my church I was about 16 years and they let me go because they found out I'd organized a pride parade in Winston and I um, was friends with a couple on Facebook and I'm sure just they never did tell me that was why they were letting me go they just told me after 16 years service they were going in a new direction mm -hmm. but I knew the real reason so um so that was hard and yeah I didn't go to church for a while you know but, but you know church music's in my blood and and I decided, okay, I'm going to go back, but it's going to be on my terms as a gay Christian. And we've both been pretty lucky in that we have not had a huge, like, internal conflict. James had a little bit more than me because he grew up Baptist. But um, I think it's part of that. But I, I, I never had any. Like, I, I fully, I feel like I have a full grasp of the Bible and it's, and it's, uh, and it's, it's errant season and, you know, exactly, you know, the flaws that can be in the, the hypocrisies that can be dealt developed from that. And I, I didn't see, I think I was creating God's image and, you know, I just, I didn't see any conflict there for myself. But, you know, I, you know fighting the, the church was another thing. And so, yeah, I went to the minister and I said, okay, I've already, I said, this, and I, I, you know, I was prepared for any church. I was going to two or three different churches in David County, and I was prepared for any of them saying, you know, from the board of the church saying, no, nah, we're just, we can't allow this. But I really thought the minister would have supported it. I thought, you know, it's like, well, yeah, you can go ask the board, you know. And the minister looked me in the eye and he said, um, you, he said, I can't give you a rational, he said, but you can't do this. I said, what do you mean I can't? I can't even, you're not even going to let me ask the board? And he said, no, I just, I can't allow this. I said, I don't understand. I said, why, why? I said, I said, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have female clergy. I said, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have thought about marrying an interracial couple. Now we don't even think anything about that. Why are you holding my feet to the fire? He said, I can't give you a rational explanation. I'm just telling you, you can't do this here. Well, and the, that, the background of that story is a lot of, like, they're worried about losing their pensions. If they get pulled, if they lose their ministry or whatever, then, you know, they, uh, minister, Methodist ministers have a pension just like teachers and other people, and they're worried about losing that. You know, that's a trouble come from that. That's where that kind of attitude comes from. But it was so disappointing and yeah, you know, I went through, stopped going to church again. It's like, I got to figure out where I'm getting married because I was, we sort of determined to have a church wedding because of our backgrounds. A lot of our friends just stood again. They think I was crazy. It's like, you know, what? You, you know, give up. These people are not, you know, they don't, they're treating sex classes. Just leave it. I'm like, there's a lot of good people there. You know, I've just got to give it a chance. But yeah, so then uh, we was a debate about doing a destination wedding down on the coast. And, but then uh, we remembered, well, James was an alumnus of uh, Wake Forest, and, and we didn't think we could afford Wake Chapel, but because his alumnus, they offered big discounts to if you got married in the summertime there, and we found out renting Wake Chapel was a lot cheaper than just renting some of the regular churches around in Winston or something. So uh, when we found that out, I was like, yeah, let's just go ahead and have a big wedding. And and we were we decided to, to do it, and, and I've always wanted, part of it's always wanted that because I'm a musician, I always wanted a big pipe organ wedding and all that, and I had about six soloists, and it was a big bash, it was fun, you know, it was, it was, it was a bunch of music recital and poetry readings, it was a wedding, but uh, but we, uh, but we, it was wonderful, and it, like, it was it was all, I, and, yeah, James didn't have any, you know, we didn't, whoever knew he was going to get married, but I always had that dream, and he, when we got together, he's like, what, what? What should, what should we do? And I said, well, what about all this? <laughs> he said, how long have you been planning this? I said, I don't know, maybe 25 years. <laughs> and so, so uh, yeah, but thankfully he was flexible and agreed with a lot of my notions. We picked out some po poetry together and did some things like that. But music-wise, he let me handle a lot of that. But, uh, but yeah, my dad, back to my dad, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he, especially when I was having this big wedding, he was like, well, he was being very, uh, not sure, he thought, well, this is just, and one time he called it stupid, and another time at a Sunday lunch table, we called it silly. It's like, what are you doing? How many people are coming? And I invited some of his friends, too, because they were friends of mine, too, and, and everything. He said, I said, I work, I'm probably going to be about 300 total. And he said, well, this is just silly something. And I cut him off. I said, you know what? <laughs> you, you can call. I said, well, he, first he said to pay for the reception for our wedding gift. I said, you can pay for the reception or not. If, I don't care. 
You can call my wedding stupid, silly, whatever. I said, you, you can keep doing what you're doing. You cannot come at this point in time. I don't care. But you will not call my wedding stupid and silly anymore in my face. And I stormed out the door, and it was a scene. And I told James why he wasn't with me. Sometimes we're together on Sunday. Sometimes we go to our own families, and he wasn't with me that day. And I came back, and we watched TV Sunday evening like we normally do. And I told James, I said, you watch it. My mom will call about 8.30, and then there'll be a... A, a reconciling on this and sure enough about 8 15 or something the phone rang and mom said i talked to your daddy and he's gonna be there and everything's fine we love you and everything i said well mom i'm grateful he's gonna be there but i said i need y'all to treat this as a happy occasion i said everybody's gonna pick their key from you i said if you're gonna have like community this is an embarrassing thing and this is not, i said then people are not gonna want to come or they're gonna be nervous about coming and they're not gonna enjoy themselves but I said, if you had like to the whole community that, hey, the, my son's getting married and stuff. If you if you share that kind of attitude, then people won't come and it'll be a great day. And um, and so uh, they they said, no, 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 yeah, we're fine. We can, we understand. We're good. And then after that, we're fine. The last two months were great. They came and it was a great big fun party. And I knew once I got dad there, he'd love because my dad he loves attention and loves a big party. And he got plenty of both that day. <laughs> so yeah, I mean he so he he was okay with that, but. Uh, but yeah, uh, religion-wise, it was a struggle. And then, and then that was we felt. But after we got married, and I went started going back to my church because I felt okay, and I knew the decision that I was going to do this year was in the works. So I thought, let me go back to you know getting this one more try. And so I went back to a Methodist churches, and James goes with me sometimes, and we went and did that. And then I knew this ruling was coming up this spring, and and I really had hope that we would get the ruling we wanted, which was the one church plan. And what that was in the Methodist church was we knew they couldn't do like a uh, outright, okay, we're going to accept gay marriage and gay clergy because, I mean, the Methodist church is a worldwide religion. And when you in some countries, like and there's a lot of Methodists in Africa, for example, you know, a lot of African countries, you know, they'll, they'll jail gays and, and, so, and even worse. And so we knew it just wasn't safe to try to, you know, push for that. So what they did is came up with what they call the one church plan. And what that meant was, you know, you could be what you wanted, what your church wanted to be. Um, and and so I thought that was a great plan because, I mean, that way if you were a very progressive liberal Methodist church and you could choose to be, a, label yourself as a progressive church and then you could accept gay clergy and accept gay marriage and then, you know, that people would know if you were a liberal gay Methodist or a liberal Methodist period, you know you'd want to go to that church. Or you could vote not to allow it. You know, if you're traditional, and they'd be called the traditionalists. Um, if you want to be a traditionalist Methodist church and not allow it, then you could vote that. And then, you know, you make it clear we're a traditionalist Methodist church, so people like me would know it's probably not the Methodist church for us. I mean, it, to me, it's a win-win because everybody got to be what they wanted. But it was such a heartbreak when I got voted down. Um, I, I, we knew the African vote, which was about, I think, almost a third now, of the Methodist Church, we knew that block would vote heavy. You know, about everybody voted against it um, because of the, of, the, of the situation there. But, uh, but I mean, it still could pass if the American Church was banned together. There was a lot of Southern Methodist churches voting against it too. And I'll tell you why they didn't voted against it was well, because they didn't want to have to vote and decide who they were, were going to be. Because think about it. I mean, if you're a lot of these Methodist churches, they're like 50 50 on this. You like half of them are older people that, no, we don't want to allow this. We don't like this stuff. But half of them's like, well, what few younger people in there or open minded elderly people that are, well, no, I've got a gay son. You know, I don't want to have this. Yeah, it forced them to have to decide what they're going to be, and that created a lot of fighting in some of it. So it was easy for them to just say, well, we're not going to change anything. We don't have to vote or talk about it. So that's why I did it. But I went and got one of my scrapbooks because, yeah, there were several hateful letters to the editors written about this, and, and some by people who weren't even Methodists, you know, trying to put their two cents about it. So I wrote a letter to the editor back. I hadn't done one in a few years. I did about eight or nine total through my whole process of organizing pride parades and things in Winston and just promoting that and explaining the gay movement and different things. But uh, I hadn't written one in two or three years, but I don't think since we've been married. And I told Jason, well, I've got, to, I've got to speak to this. So I wrote this letter called A Methodist Clarifies. And I said, as a lifelong Methodist, I'm responding to letters that have been misinterpreted, that have misinterpreted the recent ruling to forbid LGBTQ clergy members and to prohibit the officiating of same-sex marriages in the United Methodist Church. LGBTQ Methodists and their allies were not voting to force all to accept gay cler clergy in marriages. Rather, they voted to allow each congregation to decide what was best for itself. But that wasn't good enough. 
The slim majority of delegates who won the vote had to make sure no Methodist churches could accept LGBTQ Methodists. One writer espoused the hypocrisy of LGBTQ Christians who opposed Bible verses that appeared to condemn homosexuality, parentheses, subject to vast misinterpretations. Actually, the reverse is true. Hypocrisy comes from Christians who overlook many verses that could impact their convenient lives, yet latch onto verses to condemn LGBTQ communities. Which leads to final points. Aren't they tired of hating? Aren't they tired of watching the congregations of their own churches shrink to a quarter the size of 30 years ago with few children? Suicide is still three times higher for gay teens than other teens. Have Christians ever considered the possibility that they are accessories to suicide with rulings that condemn gay teens? Will we ever learn from our mistakes about segregation, disallowing interracial marriage, banishment of female clergy, and other changed views so that we can allow equal status for LGBTQ Christians? We should only be doomed to repeat bad history once. It is incredibly sad to make the same mistake over and over again. And I had a lot of friends that thanked me for the words I wrote there, but it's been hard. I was like, I had a, we went to church Easter and, um, and, uh, with my mom. And so, but I haven't been back since. Yeah. And I haven't, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm totally 50, I'm totally 50, 50 torn about the whole thing. Um, half of me, half of me feel, I, I, and all the two or three Methodist churches I attend, I know lovely people, and they're so warm and great, nice to me. And half of me's like, why am I allowing this ruling to affect my relationships with these people? You know, I mean, they had nothing to do with the ruling. They don't agree with the ruling. And half of me's like, you know, I should go back to these and go back to what I was doing, and 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 you know, let this enrich my life. But the other half of me's like, the activist half of me's like. Why should I give my time, continue to give my time, talent, and money? I'm a vocal soloist. Uh, I've seen for free. But why should I continue to give my time, talent, and money to a church that's going to continue to treat me as a second-class citizen? I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just tired of the hypocrisy and the, and the lack of education about the whole thing. And I will recommend, if nobody's ever seen, the, the, one of the best document, documentaries that address this issue is uh, For the Bible Tells Me So. I don't know if y'all have heard of that, but it's a great documentary. Uh, Eugene Robinson, Eugene Robinson, uh, the, the Episcopalian leader that came out gay as a gay uh, um, uh, worship leader, he uh, he had a big role in that. He explained like all those Bible verses and how they are subject to misinterpretation, and, and that's why I referenced that in my letter. The other thing I referenced in there, I was the, the, the editorial board was a little nervous about me putting it in there, but about how these congregations have shrunk and about how there are a few children in these churches. I said, no, that is staying in there because that's the reality. Because I went, when I got kicked out of the churches, I didn't know where I would go. And I said, well, I didn't want to do the choir directory thing more because I didn't want to be paid a salary and be beholding to, you know, I, it, it was getting to point it was hypocritical for me. So I was like, I'm going to go back and met the churches. So I'm just going to voluntarily sing and be a part of their choir and things and not try to lead the choir. But I was going to be on my terms as an open out gay Christian. And so I, I, I did that, and and it was it was uh, you know it, it it worked out okay, but it was it was it was still hard in many many aspects. And yeah, one I'll never forget uh, the one church I went to. Um, um, I was there just a month. And I, I just was real nice. Many people didn't talk about being gay at all, and I sang one solo for them. They immediately want oh please sing a solo. I sang a solo for them. And then next thing I know, the minister, female minister called me and she's like, I'm embarrassed to have to call you in for this. You know, I think you're wonderful. I want you to be a part of the church. But I, she said, a, a, a member of the choir Googled you and found out that you are a part of this equality with Salem and that you organized this pride parade. Uh, he wanted to know what your agenda was. And yeah, I mean, I, now I was like, how welcoming is that? Here, I've only been here a month. I sang for you for free. I've just been this nice person. And now you're, you know, you're, you're accusing me of having an agenda to maybe convert your church or something or bring gays to your church. I don't, you know, I was like, no, my agenda is I got fired from being a, a gay choir director and I, but I miss Methodist music and I'm trying to find another church home that's, and the reason I'm looking in Dade County is because I'm from Statesville and I want a place on the way to my mom's. So I, I, there's a lot of great gay churches in 
and Winston Salem, which I used to mention the MCC church, the Green Street Methodist yeah. in my religion, it's a wonderful LGBTQ church. But the problem is it's the wrong way towards my mom and it throw me too late to go to eat lunch with my mom. And so I would need something that's more on the way to her house. And that's why I was looking at these 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 churches but yeah it, it was a real struggle to you know to find acceptance and to find but I, you know i sort of found my way but yeah when the ruling came this past spring i've told all the i thought i've got to step away i'm not saying goodbye forever but i've got to grieve this decision and decide what's best for me and um and and yeah i've had i haven't had any clergy re reach out i really sort of i really thought one minister would have reached out to me because we texted a lot before that and would have texted me it's like i'd like to talk to you about this or something but i've had one a, a female minister of a newer church i've been going to that's not far from here here in forsyth county uh she's reached out to me a little bit and i'm i probably would go back there first just because she's the only one that's even you know talk to me and and i just think that's deplorable i mean after about three or four years of seeing these people's churches and being a part of their choir program stuff i think it would have been uh in order for the, the minister of these churches to say please talk to me if you need to talk to me or something they have it's been silence and that's just that's the reality so i don't know it's it's a process but uh I still, I, I still feel like there's a future somewhere in there for me. And of course, if the Methodist ever formally changes their ruling, I would certainly be go back straight back to it. But, um, but right now, you know, just have to find our way and see. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, we're we're sort of unusual. Most of our gay friends stay away from church at all because cause of those experience. You know, the, uh, you know, they they wisened up pretty early. It's like you know, they're not wanted and. And they, uh, we have some friends that go to the MCC church or you know gay friendly churches if they miss that part and uh, they miss uh, miss that part of their lives. But uh, but a lot of I'd say the majority of friends they're not church goers at all, man. Because they, if they were, if church was a part of their life, they felt burnt from it. So you know, mm -hmm. so it was at least that's what it was. So quite a quite a venture in the story. Wow. Yeah. Um. So to go in a slightly different direction. Mm -hmm. Um, so after you came out, what were some of the organizations you work with to integrate yourself into the community? Yeah, that sort of drove everything I did. Um, I, uh, that's how I learned my parents' knee. I mean, they, they were community people, and that's, that was what I grew up with. So that's what I knew, so I certainly emulated them. Um, yeah, I would join the men's course at first, <laughs> and I, um, I was certainly blessed with them for a year or two. And... Um, and uh, do you want to talk something, uh, a Coke or something out of the refrigerator or something? Um, I'm good. I'm okay, you're, you're sure? Okay, well, just Thank you. anytime, <laughs> just let one of us that's not talking be glad to get you some. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I, I, I did the men's course first, and that was a blessing for a year or two. Well, another friend had started the Triad Softball League in 2000 and around 2004, and they got together that fall, and I love playing softball. My mom was a softball player, and I... I like playing, so I, uh, a friend and I went and uh, played softball with them that fall. And there's about 30, 30 or 35 of us, both men and women, uh, in this league. Um, that uh, that we, we just, it wasn't really much a league. We just sort of got together, we divided into a few teams informally, and just sort of played about eight or nine weeks in the fall. Well, when we came to the end of October and it got cold, people uh, said, gosh, this was a lot of fun. I hate to... You know, it was like, I hate to stop me on Sunday. So I said, well, I said, I can run a wintertime bowling league. I said, I'm a bowler too. My mom was a league bowler. And I said, I can run a bowling league if y'all like to to do like bowl this winter together. And, and so I was like, yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. So I uh, investigated about where to do that. And I knew I need to pick something sort of centrally located because we were all from either Winston, Greensboro, or High Point. So I called Cartersville, uh, Countryside Lanes, uh, that um, that October or so, right after, right after we got done Playing softball, I said, I've got some friends. I said, we're interested. I said, we're interested in doing a Sunday afternoon bowling league in the wintertime. We'll probably just do 10 or 12 weeks here to get started, and we might grow after that. Depends on how we grow. And I said, and he said, oh, yeah. I love and see, that's bowling leagues, even in a busy city, even when they're busy, the one time they have a hard time having the leagues during Sunday afternoons in the fall because of pro football. No, no people who normally bowl like want to bowl during football time. But our people, that's where we don't really, I mean, there's a few of us that really like pro football, but most of us, like, we really could care less. So, so that was like perfect. So that's perfect timing. So he said, oh yeah, I, that's, I'd love to have a Sunday afternoon league. And, uh, I, and I said, 
okay, I said, I'll get my people together. But I said, well, I want you to know right now. I said, I know Kernsville at the time was a pretty conservative little town. It was, even though it wasn't far from Winston or Greensboro, I mean, it was, it was conservative. And so I said, I just want you to, this is a special kind of league. I said, we're, we're going to be an LGBT bowling family. I said, we're, we're adults and I don't think we're, you know, we're going to do anything inappropriate for you to worry about. But I said, you know, I just want to let you know that we're not going to necessarily be, you know, we're going to be meeting as gay adults and we're not going to be, you know, trying to hide that fact. And he said, oh, no, I think it'll be fine. Yeah, you come on and everything. Well, we were nervous about it that first year because we didn't know what we'd receive stuff. And um, and it turned out to be such a blessing. And I'm still running it today, uh, eight, like six, 15 years later. Um, it was um, the the stat. I mean, I, I think I think we did a lot to change attitudes, of, especially the Kernsville bowling management for sure. But uh, and all the people that worked there, but people that visited the alley while we were there. I mean, you know, they saw that we were we were regular. You know, we we're just fun, loving people, and we were really good to the staff because that's just sort of who we. I mean, we took time to talk to the ladies at the diner, and and we and we and when we got done that first season, we gave this huge, beautiful white bouquet of flowers it was a beautiful flower arrangement uh one of my friend, uh, friends had made and stuff we gave and we gave this beautiful flowers to the bowling alley and this arrangement so well they never had it you know you know if you ever industrially just like hey grab me a beer you know that's it's a whole different attitude so they really loved that we were there and that we were really kind to them and and so we made a big family there and uh it was a big that was a big start and that really sort of opened up other doors for me because uh because that really grew up because we were sort of starving for groups in and even if you were just slightly interested in bowling, like I had people want to be a part of that because there wasn't that many groups way back then. And so, yeah, my bowling league went from 10 teams of four people that first year. For uh, We had 14 teams the next year. I had 16 teams the third year. In the fourth year, we went up to 22 teams. We had about took over the whole alley. And, uh, yeah, in one year, we did have the whole alley, 24 teams and 96 people. And, uh, and, and the, the softball equally grew. I never was in charge of softball. I, I coached teams and I played softball for quite a few years, but I never was in charge of it. They, they run a ton of people through that softball. They have a lot of sponsorships and going on with it tied to it too. And yeah, there's been always been at least six teams of 17 people, I um, mean, you know, at least a hundred involved every year and they have a lot of turnover. They still get new people every year. So a lot of people in that. And then yeah, from softball, uh, I met a lot of people and got more and more involved. And then, uh, yeah, a friend of mine, a couple of fr friends in bowling were involved in AIDS care services. And they knew I had a, they knew I bought up this big house and could entertain, you know, have parties and stuff. And they invited me to be a board member of AIDS care services and to be a fun fundraiser for them. I said, yeah, I think I'm ready to do things like that. So that was in 2010. And I joined that. And at the same time, my friend Steve McGinnis, um, um, uh, he's, he's, he, he was working on organizing this group called Equality Wins and Salem. The reason for that was, um, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, two guys who had just uh, adopted two kids, um, tried to get a family discount at the YMCA here in Winston Salem. And they went and said, we'd like to uh, join your, the Y and have a family discount package. And they looked them straight and I said, you're not a real family. Well, that was about the straw that broke Steve's back and many of the rest of us when we heard that story. And I was like, you know, we just, we got visibility problems here. We got, you know, people just don't, you know, this is 2010. This is ridiculous. So, um, but the reality was we hadn't had a pride parade since 1996 in Winston. And the reason for that was back when pride parades got started in North Carolina, it was totally organized out of Raleigh. It was like one pride parade. But in their credit to their benevolence when they organized. They did, I think, a couple in Raleigh, but then they realized, hey, we need to get all the cities because, you know, Charlotte needs one, Asheville needs one, Winston needs one, Greensboro needs one. So they wrote, they moved those, those. they, they said, okay, let's do, let's do one a year. So 1996 was the year when they came to Winston. And that was the only property that, to my knowledge, has ever been in Winston. So we went from 1996 to 2010, didn't have anything. So yeah, there was a lot of, um, and I wrote a, a letter to I can address that too uh, about you know just raising awareness because yeah I mean I counted up to four I mean yeah back in the nineties you know there was just a couple of churches and AIDS care services and the men's course got started around nineteen ninety eight but there's only a few groups 
and everything. And yeah, I counted by 2010, we had like 40 churches, organizations, softball league, volleyball, bowling league, you know, and people weren't aware that we had all this. So yeah, and so Steve reached out to me. He's like, Dirk, I want you to help me with this. We need to co-found this group. He said, I want you to be in charge of prayer. I think it'd be great to pray. So I'd like to see some professional floats and I said, yeah, I said, uh, I think I can do that. But I just joined these Christians. I was like, Lord, well, I'm, I'm taking on two big things here. But but I took them both on. It was a busy year and a half there. But uh, but I was trying to do fundraising for the Ace Care and did a lot to help keep them going. And then, uh, and then yeah, I took over the parade. And, and I ended up getting 16 professional floats um, uh, for that parade. Uh, and that was just, that was all anybody could talk about. I mean, uh, I, it was, it, we had to pay for it. Some of the groups like Wake Forest Law School, they got, they paid for their float. And they, these, back then, these professional floats still cost five or 600 each or something. But some groups like Wake Forest Law School, they paid their whole float. But now a lot of the like AIDS care service, we paid half of their float. They could get 300 scraped together to, uh, to cover it, but we paid the other 300. And then, but then there was a few floats, like for the stu few student alliances we had then, we bought two floats for them because obviously they didn't have the money or means. So West Forsyth had a really good student alliance, so we bought a float for them, and then we bought another float just for any other alliance students, but there weren't many back then. And I mean, that's something that has exploded since now about every high school has a, a, a gay straight alliance, but uh, back then, you know, it was just a little pockets here and there. So, so yeah, my friend Mary, who was in charge of all the money stuff, she's like, oh, I don't know. And we ended up paying 5000 out of our own fundraising to have these flows and stuff. And, and Mary's like, I don't know if we ought to be paying this much money for something like this. And Steve said, trust me, Mary, that's all people will remember about the day. And yeah, when we had, we had, I had literally a thousand people to pray. We had 16 floats, 16 different churches, organizations, nonprofits on these floats, two floats with kids, mm -hmm. high school kids. And, um, and, and it was just such a magical day of, yeah. and a thousand, I was there. Yeah. Yeah. before I knew yeah, that, this is right before we met, but it was yeah. great. Oh yeah. It was an amazing parade. A thousand people in the parade and, and then five, we didn't know who all would be there to watch it. And there were like five or 6,000 line in fourth street. It was a perfect a fall afternoon. And, uh, it was just a magical day and, and it was a blessing and stuff. And, and I, and it, I, I it was, it was, um, it, it was it was it was incredible and it was and it was incredible to get the feedback. Let me get a letter. A child, one of the West Forsyth <laughs> kids, read. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, one of the uh, uh, well, this is a this is a letter I had. This is one right before the prey came out. We had a lot of people that were here and that we were doing this and we were getting a lot of negative letters in the Western Journal, like, you know, why are we having pride and these, you know, these these people, we don't want to see a drag queen coming down the street, this kind of stuff. So I wrote this letter um, to, you know, to address that. I said, there have been questioning comments regarding the planning of Winston Salem 2011 Pride Parade. I feel clarification is needed. The purpose of the Equality Winston Salem Committee's parade is for citizens of Winston Salem, both gay and straight, to be aware of the growth and presence of the gay affirming community here. When the last Pride Parade occurred in 1996, there were just a handful of LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender organizations in Winston-Salem. PFLAG, AIDS Care, um, the Adam Foundation, three or four churches. Today, we have logged over 40 organizations and we are still counting. We have bowling and softball leagues and organized volleyballers. We have a men's course. We have at least 13 gay or gay affirming churches. We have gay straight alliances in some high schools. This has exploded exponentially since 1996. We will provide a release of participating organizations later. Our goal now is simply to raise awareness of exactly how far we've reached into our community. The world has changed in 15 years and we need Winston-Salem to recognize equality for all taxpayers. Yes, we seek reversal of hate policies like the recent YMCA ruling that states my gay friends with children are not really families. Yes, we seek to end political commentary like those misleading remarks of Representative Larry Brown that were without compassion or logic. But we seek to do so in a professional and kind manner. And this parade will reveal as much. So after the parade, I got several emails from like some of the students and stuff that were, that made me just ball. And this one child wrote this, um, this, um, this letter to the editor uh, from West Forsyth uh, after the experience. He said, on October 15th at the Winston-Salem Pride Parade, I had the time of my life. I was there to support LGBTQ 
Equality and Rights with my Equality Club from West Forsyth High School. When I arrived at the parade on Saturday morning, I felt so uplifted because this was my first time experiencing something like this. And I love the diversity of people who are there to offer support. Gates and Straight Alike showed up to promote equality. Generous people and organizations had paid for our club to have our own professional float in the lineup. I was ecstatic and beyond grateful that somebody would actually do that for us. We were on the float for all of 45 minutes, and when it was over, I was almost voiceless. The whole time, we screamed to the crowds who, who roared back at us. The embrace of the supporting um, people were so warm. The 4,000 plus lined the streets as the floats rolled down the pavement. I'm very lucky that I could experience it all. When the recent spike in LGBTQ youth suicides, I just wish the kids who, who are slumped in the depression about their sexuality could feel the embrace of hope the pride people gave me. They need to know there are people out there that support them. With hope, more people will come out for 2012 Pride and be instilled with a sense of encouragement as I was that wonderful day. I just meant the world that that child wrote that. And yeah, I had kids that email me. It's like, you know, we didn't realize anybody loved us. And I mean, just I told my co, we had a big dinner of steak and salmon with my um, co-founders, Mary and Rex and uh, Steve that few days after that, and I said, you know, if we if we did nothing but sit on the t couch and watch TV the rest of lives, we did something important this day. And, uh, and I read some of the emails some of those kids had written, man, it was a lot like that letter. And uh, that was just a blessing. And yeah, because of that effort, Pride's still going day. We ran it the next year. That was the year we got Taylor Day, and Steve was really <laughs> wanting to... Um, he was so big, he's like, I want a diva, or a famous diva to sing at our Pride. And, he, and, and so... Uh, we knew uh, they all cost a lot of money, but we decided we could, if we did enough gay bingo and we could probably uh, probably raise enough to maybe get Taylor Dane and we accomplished that. And that was our second pride. And at, but after that, the four of us merged with North Star because we realized our missions were sort of aligned with North Star to like start LGBTQ scholarships. And we were, and there were other people that interest because Pride's a year. It's like Mary said, it's a screaming baby. I mean, it's like you can't like because a few weeks after you're done with it, you can't. You have to get your sponsors lined up for the next one. It's a year-round thing, and we just we knew we had other things we wanted to do, so we turned it over to other people who wanted to do just Pride, and they bit other people running it the past six, seven years, and it's it's kept growing and been a, just a wonderful. Wonderful blessing. And I think it has brought a lot of awareness to our community. I think, you know, a lot of people, when they saw, I mean, they had no idea. I mean, you know, they saw that huge parade. They thought it would be just a few little drag queens and a few little, what they would call freaks coming down the street or something. And when they saw this massive amount of organized adults and families, gay families, and, you know, I think it, it changed a lot of attitudes. So, I, uh, it's been a blessing and so it's great and, and I was just grateful uh, led to our I mean we just I mean it's just so weird like the process of I mean yeah when we first met like we had no idea we'd have a chance to get get married you know I mean and, and we we're just so grateful that you know all, everything aligned that you know during the Obama administration that you know that the gay marriage law passed and and then we were able to discuss it and actually have our wedding in 2016. I mean, we had no idea when we first met we'd ever have that dream of having that. But um, but we still keep fighting. A lot of a lot of like, why do you keep working? And I, I just now retired from North Star uh, after six years. But but I I'm like, why do you keep fighting? So I was like, well, gay marriage it's not over. And look what's going on now politically. I mean, you know, we thought abortion was settled law and you know the right women's right to control their own bodies and look what's happening with that now and we feel like our marriage could be equally at stake i mean it's uh that, that's a scary prop, prop reality and and beyond that i mean we still could be legally fired in north carolina for being gay at our workplace i mean legally a boss can say well i'm sorry you're gay you're fired and, and that happened to me at my church job and yeah i mean that's the reality too in fact i had a friend who was a teacher and a really good teacher and went to the charter school in greensboro and uh, she was one of those couples when that ruling went down that Thursday or Friday. She was one of the seven or eight couples that went to the Guilford County Courthouse and and got married and was on the news and stuff. She went to her school that Monday morning and the principal said, oh, we saw that you got married uh, on Friday night. Congratulations. You got 30 minutes to clean out your desk. And she was immediately fired on the spot. Even though she was a great teacher, the kids loved her and everything. But that that's, that's the reality. So... Um, I don't know. It was, it was uh, it, it's, it's just been, it's been an amazing eight years. Of, of a lot of highs and lows, and 
And, you know, so, but we, you know, we're going to keep fighting till we, as I say, till it's totally normalized and there's no need to think about it. And, and, um, and a conversation can be had about how we try to figure out who we are, you know, in our own group. I mean, the acronym's another discussion that might be on your list to talk about. But yeah, I mean, that's another thing is like how, you know, we're, uh, how we have this living acronym. And that's what it is. Because yeah, you know, in the early days it was just LG when it first got going in the 1970s, right after Stonewall. But they quickly added the BT for bisexual transgender because you know that was a significant group for sure. Um, and we certainly clearly see so the past five or six years mm -hmm. how equal in size they are. And so that was quickly added. But then, yeah, it, it wasn't. And for a long time, it was just LGBT, and it still is for some people. But now you're seeing the Q pretty common and commonly accepted everywhere now. And that was hard because um, that was hard for a lot of gay men our age. Because, and I had and two of my co-founders in the quality group fought it from. They didn't want to, North Star to be known as an LGBTQ group. And they were, and the reason for that was cause you know queer was used as a as a derogatory word against us in high you know like it was the same as fag I mean you know like we were called queer bay queer you know I mean that was a word very popular to to be derisive in North Carolina and yeah that brought back those feelings for and, and you know we certainly can understand that but obviously the reason the Q got was from the youth movement and, you know queer nation from MTV and the and a lot of youth were identifying you know hey I'm so gay I'm queer you know and and they it was a it was a word of empowerment to them and my feeling was I certainly felt understood both things but I felt like it was valuable to have it added just because it also stands for questioning and to me that is the most critical group I mean all because we were both were questioning in high school and and you know these kids in middle and high school that know they have these feelings and are questioning their sexuality they need to know they have support groups and they're loved and there's an alliance there for them and you know they need to know they have all those things that we didn't have when we came through mm -hmm. and so you know that's that's why I, I agree I fought for that inclusivity just cause you know to help support those kids too so yeah and who knows where to go guys so there's other there a lot, a lot of times you see the IA added for intersexual and asexual and ally and the cisgender I mean I, I don't you know we, we don't want it to become because we feel like it, it gets it, people won't take it as seriously if it keeps getting to be too many letters but yet we don't want to be exclusive to any group that feels left out so I don't know uh, I don't know you know that's something that keeps being discussed in all our groups about how to how to handle that but but uh, I, I yeah I definitely want to err on the side of inclusivity for sure I mean I never would want people to feel left out and and I'm in, I'm I'm glad to see the pronoun sensitive sensitivity being uh, um, pushed um, uh, here lately. Um, I'm going to shut up in a minute and let Jay share some stuff, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm the one that sort of organized all the pride stuff, so it sort of made sense I dominated this part of it, but, but the, uh, but yeah, the set pronoun sensitivity has been a great, because I'm also, I was on the equity diversity team for Guilford County Schools. I work in Guilford County, and I'm very proud of them because Dr. Contreras, our superintendent, she said, I want every child to feel welcome, to feel safe, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of race. And so we, we did an equity diversity team. The 72 of us were spent to be trained two years to go out. I mean, we went, it seemed like overnight, we went from having like books challenges about gay penguins and stuff being challenged in schools to, I was ordered to get LGBT books for my elementary school and and being trained to go talk to the staff about being an LG, you know, welcoming the LGBTQ community. And I was like, that's just, that was amazing to go from that, uh, like um, I say almost overnight, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we were very, yeah, I was very grateful to have that experience. And, and so I got to go out the past year and share about five or six different elementary schools that I was assigned to talk about what it was like to, um, you know, to train. And yeah, we talked about the acronym, but yeah, we talked about pronoun sensitivity. I said, yeah, and we explained how in your small group, really when you introduce yourself, like, you know, what, what do you, what do you, are you comfortable with it? Or do you like he or she or they, or a z some, some are, you know, there's what, what, what pronoun are you comfortable with? And so, and, and then my email, every email I send both personal and professional uh, right underneath my name before I even list my organization stuff I put uh, I put you know he you know prefer pronoun he him his what is this you know and, and there's a hot link to the UNCG um, diversity center you know explaining the history of why pronouns matter and and so yeah I'm hoping and I really fought for Guilford County to adopt this and I really pushed the guidance kind of like you know you really we really need to start practicing what preaching we really need to and you know, I think this is a nice little gesture but it's been a hard uh, I've had a, even friends I was close like oh that's just silly I'm like you know my thing is 
why does it hurt? I mean, it's just there. I don't even think about it. I just send my emails. Yeah, it's nothing I even think about. Probably 99% of the people that get my emails don't think about it either. But my feeling is if I end up having correspondence with that one transgender person or that person who does appreciate that sensitivity about the pronouns, how, how much would that mean to them to see that in my signature to know that I care to offer that, you know? So, so I just, to me, it's just a no brainer to have that. But, uh, but yeah, this, it's been a little bit of a process to try to get, you know, I said, eventually I think it's going to be mandated. I said, you're going to see it probably roll out just like gay rights and benefits and stuff. You're going to see it roll out in the fortune 500 countries. I bet you'll start seeing a place like Google and Apple mandate it in their employee mail. And then obviously universities are already sort of almost about ready to mandate that among their staff. And when you see, and then it'll spill to the other schools and everywhere else. But uh, so it'll eventually happen, I think. But it's uh, uh, a little ahead of my time on that. But mm -hmm. so, what's your thought about any of all that? I just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, definitely the the uh, transgender issue is the the, 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 the new gay. Yeah. Um, I, I, even for gay people. Um, it's it's difficult water to navigate now. Well, we uh, thought I'm a kid. It, it just it just it just happened so quickly too. I mean, we basically just got to the point where we had marriage equality, and then mm -hmm. like hard on the heels of that, the transgender community really became a big force to be reckoned with and very visible very quickly it seemed like and well we think i mean we used to like like heterosexual we thought transgender was a small population we thought, yeah. and then we realized it's because yeah. they're heavily closeted i mean it was hard enough for us to come out yeah. imagine telling your parents you want to change sexes i mean you know how hard would that be but i think one good thing caitlin, even though caitlin jenner can be a polarizing figurehead in many ways i think one good thing about caitlin jenner was it really opened that conversation up and and you know made people aware and i think it's emboldened a lot of transgender to come on out and to pursue that and and you just don't really realize and i and i said that it makes sense to me that's my own personal theory but i told james said why would they be any different size than us i mean if we're maybe four percent of the population and lesbians are four percent or something why would transgender be four percent i mean to me that just makes sense i mean after i think about it i mean it didn't seem like it 18 years ago but i mean it would make sense and yeah i mean that's why we get so upset like you know the rulings like trying to kick transgender out of the military i mean there are eleven thousand transgender in the military i mean that's that's a lot of people i mean we have 1.4 million in our military and eleven thousand are transgender and yeah people we just don't realize that we think you're just talking about a few people no it's more than a few yeah, I'm afraid some members of the gay community might not pay as much attention to that is issue as they should. Uh, not just for it being inclusive and and compassionate towards this community, but because if they manage to roll back or squash rights for the transgender community, then they'll probably be rolling backward and coming back against us, uh, which is what I'm sort of concerned about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, more so, I've, I've seen it in my well, non yes. Yeah, I've talked to James. I mean, we had one transgender on board North Star, and they, they, a lot of times they don't trust us, which that, that just blows my mind. Like, you can't trust gays and lesbians. Who can you trust in this society? But they feel like in many ways, you know, we can backstab them, and, and you see that happen. That was on that Survivor show a couple years ago when the gay man sort of threw the transgender on the bus and they outed him. And, then, you know, it was like, and, that, yeah, and I was, was like, cool. yeah, I mean, and we have our own problems work out in our own community. I mean, gays, we can be as cliquish as anybody else. I mean, gay men tend to socialize just with gay men, and lesbians will tend to socialize with lesbians, and it's not too often in bowling leagues and things like that we all cross paths. But just, you know, like going to the movies on a Saturday night, we tend to get in our groups, and the same with the transgendered, and I wish we were more of an open group like that. Like at our wedding, we had quite a few lesbian couples we invited, but I was in these organizations with me, but, every, but we had 11 groomsmen. They were all our gay male friends. I didn't have any lesbians in the wedding party, and that's just our reality, and, and I'm not proud of that. I wish mm -hmm. we was a little bit more you know, mixed than that, but that's, that's, that's part of our process and everything. And, you know, it's, but, 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 but it, even if we don't do it probably in our lives, like sometimes, but we definitely need to be compassionate and we're to hang together yeah, publicly uh, yeah, for sure. And, Cause I think, you know, that's what a lot of the political agenda is now is dividing all the minorities cause they don't want them. Cause if all the minorities unite their majority and they don't want that. So, right. so that's, that's, we're, we're well aware of that. So, 
Yeah. We watch Rachel Maddow every night. So. <laughs> <laughs> Were you involved with any of the um, political rallies relating to any of the anti-LGBT initiatives in North Carolina over the years? Well, I attended a couple. I attended the hearing of, of Folwell, our state treasurer, um, when he did a lot of anti-gay um, rhetoric in Carnesville, and I went to that, and I spoke up against him at that rally. I'll never forget he had a gay high school friend, and I, I, he, he didn't say this, but I knew it. He said, he, he looked at him and said, Dale, how long have we known each other? He said, since high school. He said, we know each other my whole life. And he said, you're really doing this to me? He was pushing them. He was saying the, the 2012 when they were voting on the gay marriage. And he said, you're really doing this to me and my people? And he said, and I thought, oh, gosh, that, was a, that put a silence in the room. And um, that really, but yeah, I mean, it just it just takes our breath away, the, you know, what we see politically going on. But yeah, through our groups and, uh, you know, North Star and things, we've been very politically active that way. But, um, but beyond that, you know, we're not too... I, I, yeah, I'm embarrassed to say, I guess, or we're not, we haven't been out on the streets, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I can see myself, if, if certain trends continue and things start going backwards, then that might change, but. Well, sure, if we ever yeah, got our marriage was in jail, Yeah, oh yeah, yeah then yeah, I'll be out there for sure the on the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. As you get older, it's a little harder to. To inconvenience your your you, you don't want to be uncomfortable in your order climate things like that but uh, but yeah I, I would say we have our limits but we're certainly aware I mean we say we we watch we we're, read yes we're very yeah. aware we love this show Gay USA it's on a, I don't know if you're aware about it. it's this older couple in New York City and it airs four times a week I don't know the network that I was telling them it's like yeah. what's it it's F it's, I'm not sure what it is but it's something broadcast out of New York City but it's a great show just to keep you up update on both national and and international gay news like all these little instances of oppression or instances yeah. of celebration if you're, if you're not familiar with yeah. that you should catch it it's, yeah it's, it's it's awesome yeah and and it's a, a an older gay and lesbian well, who uh, they, they have been this out of new york and they've both been involved in the gay rights yeah. struggle and from they're the very beginning i both think they're both in their 70s probably or, or something close like that. to it so they they're sort of more than the stonewall generation and but yeah, they're, it's, they're really wonderful to listen to. We watch that on the weekends. It, it, uh, the first broadcast is Friday afternoon. They do about three or four broadcasts of the same show through Sunday evening. And then they do a new one the next week, just reviewing the week's news of, of the two. And that's, that's really a great show. We like that a lot too, to keep our, so yeah, we, we feel an obligation to keep ourselves up to date and abreast. Uh, and we, we're very big on that. But, uh, but yeah, we certainly probably could be more involved uh, and doing more things. We'll see. I don't know, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the year brings. Yeah, current current political climate may force us to. <laughs> yeah. So, James, you were involved with P five Winston Salem. Uh, yeah. mainly as an attendee of their meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I never, I never even heard of them or really was aware of them before. 2001 when I started to go to their meetings just because I was looking for answers and conversation and someone to talk with myself at that point. Um, but uh, other than I was never heavily involved with them, I'm sort of embarrassed to say. Uh, and I guess that they're still, they're still active and still meeting and a lot of these groups, I think, I don't know, they might struggle more nowadays because there's so many other outlets and venues. Well, yeah, I think P Flag's membership has fluctuated a lot, mainly yeah. because like the Gay Straight Alliances, because really P Flag was there because schools didn't have Gay Straight Alliances back in like 1990s. But now, just as I say, about every high school has a gay straight line. Some are stronger than others. Depends on the, you know, you'll get that really extroverted gay senior, and he might rally 20 or 30 kids to be a part of this group. But then you'll get a school, like, if you don't have that really strong leader, they might have just a couple that need or something. One thing that did shock me about that, because uh, back to how these congregations are shrinking in the Methodist churches, and I've seen it in all these churches I visited, and, and one church I attend has a, a shrink. Like most of the congregations I see, they're down to, like, 24 people on a Sunday and the average age is probably 78 and there's like maybe one child that comes and so they was like we need more people more people involved so I reached out I, I was like well I'm curious what they have as a because I knew there was no 
gay affirming church in David County. I said, this is a this is something that can be tapped. I said, let me find out. So I reached out to Davy High School. I was just because I knew it's a pretty because there's one high school for the whole county. And they have about two thousand four hundred and five hundred kids, so it's a pretty big high school. So I was like, um, reached out to them. But I even so I thought this conservative county. I said they probably got a really small gay straight line if they even got one. So I reached out and found out they did have a spot on my sponsor and stuff. And she, she said they had sixty kids in their gay straight lines. That shocked me because I don't know of one that big in Forsyth County. And I told my minister, I said, y'all need to look into this. I said, you need to find out that she'll let you come talk to these kids. I said, you know, just offer like a weekend pizza party, hang out. Play. They might be looking at a safe place to be on a weekend or something. There's not a gay affirming church in David County that I know about. And I said, you might look into that. But, but that really was encouraging me that a conservative high school like that would have that big of a gay straight alliance. So, but again, it's your leadership. It's like, do you have that right faculty person? Do you have that right, the right kids that are pushing for it, but, um, but yeah, I think P-Flag has seen a membership, because, yeah, I mean, P-Flag was there as be able to have an option when there was no gay straight lines. Now, they're, I guess they're finding themselves, when they are still active, partnering with these groups to help these uh, kids and everything, but but that's for sure dry. I mean, though, even though we never decided to have children and, and never had any desire to, to have our own kids, we feel very strongly about, you know, stopping gay teen suicide and, you know, have the kids having things that we never had. And, I still you know. I still don't know if there's really anything there for the gay teen who comes out to their parents and gets kicked out of the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, where do they go? They're, I still, if there's anything organized to handle that kind of situation, I'm not aware of it. Well, that's why we started North Star. Um, we're not equipped to like take necessarily take in anybody overnight at that at the North Star Center, but we do have like a couple of uh, psycho uh, social workers and stuff that uh, that you know are special. Like with, like if if there was somebody if if the team knew to call, I mean, uh, getting them out, getting them to be aware of this is a place to call. But yeah, if a team call, in fact, we did handle one like that while I was on board that somebody called and and she knew where to to recommend that child go and. So yeah, we we had means to help with that and everything, but uh, but yeah, I mean that, that's like we we want we want to see the eighteen suicide yeah. reduced. I mean you know all suicide is bad and it should all be eradicated. I mean and just stands us that you know that so much is done in the name of what they think is moral and righteous. It really does the opposite and kills these kids and and it's like uh, that's got to be fixed. Yeah, and I've seen the protests up front. I mean, when I went to, I did go to Green Street for a while, just to have that experience. And uh, yeah, that Easter when I was at Green Street, I mean, uh, that was just when the ruling had come out, and Green Street had announced they were not going to do any more heterosexual marriage till everybody could be married. And, and yeah, this this uh, very radical Baptist church came with about ten or twelve members screaming at us while we were walking into our church and screaming hate. Yeah, I was there for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very... It's the only time know, I've ever really experienced that yeah, firsthand. I, I've seen a few at the Pride, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. corners of the Pride and everything, but mm -hmm. but it was it was just so sad to, to experience that. And I say at this day and age, I mean, that seems so 1990s or something, but it's still alive and well. And, uh, and as long as figures like Franklin Graham are out there promoting this hate and and promoting you know this concept of superiority it's, it's going to be hard to overcome but they, we see it getting a little better and a little better I mean not in the poll nationwide polls reflect I mean yeah 20 years ago you could have gotten America to agree as a majority on gay marriage and you know that quickly changed during the Obama administration and, and now the vast majority support us and and yeah I don't I don't think they'll ever put we go back on gay marriage. I think there's just been too much love that's been shared and everything. But but I wouldn't take anything for granted. No. So, you know, no. you know. uh, can you speak to the differences generationally between LGBT people when you were coming out and the young people coming out today? Night and day. <laughs> oh yeah. It just. Um, well, I say they have so much. The great thing for the youth today is they have so many. They have the gay straight alliances. I, something I've seen that develop that's wonderful is about all the big cities now have gay youth courses. Uh, what I'd love to have had that. And uh, yeah, that's the hardest I ever cried was at my very first um, g gala uh, gathering in 2002 in Cincinnati. They had they had the very first gay youth course that they had just organized a few years before that, and to that and about around the year 2000. But it was the Vancouver. And it was, it was only about eight or nine kids, but they got up there and they sang these little songs. And they, then they get this testimony between. Them. It's like, well, my name is Jack, and I have a boyfriend named Bill, 
um, my dad, it's not talking to me right now. My mom, and I I was just, I was like, because half of me was crying. I was so grateful those kids had something we didn't have. But then half of me, you know, was was sort of sad for us that, you know, we went through what we went through didn't have a means. But then half of me was grateful they did have it and get to see it and stuff. But that was in 2002. Now, yeah, now we have like 20 youth courses when we have gala that come. Just about every big city in the United States has a gay youth course. And I like to see us get one going. And, and I know William Sutherland, our director, uh, in fact, we changed our name from Triad Pride Men's Course to Triad Pride Performing Arts. And when, now the women's course is bigger than the men's course. And I think there's a plan in the works to try to get some kind of youth course going. Obviously, that's harder because you're like mar- marrying multiple high schools, transportation. And, you know, there's a lot more issues like, you know, how to get kids. But but uh, but I think there's a plan to see that happen in the Triad. And uh, certainly hope so. Because, yeah, I mean, kids, if you like to sing at all, it's just another means to have another out if you're... A, a kid who has questioning themselves and you like music, then you know it's a no brainer to have something like that. So, and they're they're coming out younger and younger, which just sort of blows my mind. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, middle school. I mean, yeah, definitely, we got a lot of middle school kids who are questioning, and and even in fifth grade, uh, we see that every day. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm in a little country elementary school in Guilford County, in the country, and. Uh, we had a fifth grade. Um, we have a fifth grader this past year that's thinking there there might be a transgender issue, and they would talk to our guidance counselor about it. I don't know the name. You know, we keep privacy very real. But I get the resources for her to have to share with this kid. But we but we definitely have like a lot of kids with gay parents, and we work with that as counseling. But yeah, we're seeing even in fifth grade. And, but the trans what we do deal with in elementary school is the transgender issue. Um, uh, the um, yeah, I mean because. We're, I, and and I was at a, this is at a regular school, my previous school. This is about five years ago. Stuff we I had a kindergarten boy come back first grade identifying as a girl, and I had a kindergarten girl come back identifying as a boy. Boy, that was an eye opening experience. I mean, and that was sort of hard for our staff too. And um, and I was in charge of I was a sensitivity coach, and I had to talk to the entire staff of the school about that. And um, and I and and. And you know, and I think we've seen that explode from the Caitlin. You know, we're seeing a lot more of that now. And yeah, if anybody saw the Diane Sawyer interview about Caitlin Jenner, I mean, you know, scientists, the behavioral scientists are saying as early as eighteen months, kids show language and motions or stuff that maybe show these kids are identifying with the opposite sex that they were born to. And that's really fascinating to think about. But yeah, it's obvious in some of these kids that are five and six that you know that they're they're that they're they're wanting to be. You know, not identify with a different sex, and that's and we're working that. And it was hard for our our, our teachers because you know, like we had to allow this first grade boy to go with the girls to the bathroom. Well, we had to send a letter home to parents and stuff. And we had one family, um, a religious family, leave our school over it. It's like you know, no way it was my girl. We uh, te- we explained the letters like you know, the teacher will be sent, the child will be given their own private style, the teacher will be monitoring the whole time. But even so, you know, one family wanted no part of that. And it was so hard for our, you know, some of our staff was like, I can't believe we got to do that. And I'm like, I said, let me just put it to you this way. I said, if my choice is between mama and the psychologist that says my child needs to try to do, this child needs to, to do this, and we need to support that, or daddy who beats the heck out of the child for putting on mama's dresses till he's the age of 15 and then he runs away from home. I'm putting my eggs in this basket. I mean, you know, I'm sorry. Because yeah, this has happened to three of my friends. And I don't see that happen to anybody else. And yeah, I'll never forget uh, Donnie, who's a friend of my friend, BK. Uh, he was the son of a Baptist minister. And he went through that. And um, and uh, yeah, he, 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 he finally just had to run away. And and, um, and I, I remember I met him one time at, at BK's house. And um and he said, he said, I didn't talk, I didn't, he said, I didn't see or talk to my dad the next 25 years till he died. And the next time I saw my dad, I did his hair and his casket. I thought, oh, what a, what a story that was. But, uh, but what I loved about Donnie was, uh, you know, even though he was a pretty flamboyant kind of guy and he was a hair styler, he checked a lot of the, the cliche boxes, uh, but I loved the story told one time, so like, cause yeah, especially back in 2000, you know, it's not so much now, but yeah, I, I got some like, what do y'all do on weekends and what's your life like? You know, what, what do you do at home? You know, it's, it's almost like we're this 
with these wild exotic creatures who do all this crazy stuff. And, and, and Donnie looked at her and said, well, my daffodils bloomed this week in the yard and I went and picked a few this morning. <laughs> do you have daffodils? You know? And you know, the whole point of that was like, no, we just pretty much have normal lives like you. You know, we're not this crazy you know, thing that you think we are or something. You know, we just happen to like the same sex. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting person and story too. But yeah, we're seeing a lot more in school. And that's why we organized this equity diversity because we're seeing because of the Caitlyn Jenner and we're seeing a lot more open, especially in the transgender area, these kids, you know, uh, going forward and identifying and, 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 and when we're providing the supportive atmosphere for that comfortability, you know, it makes and, it even And that's easier. probably the only place they're getting that support yeah. too. I mean, I, I mean, part of me, I can definitely, definitely sympathize with a, a parent who's dealing yeah, it'd be with a child thing. that young yeah. And if they don't have any kind of a support group or advice on how to deal with this, imagine how stressful and complicated that is. Um, yeah. and a child that comes out at nine or 10 to their parents, I mean, hopefully the parents aren't going to throw them out in the street like they might do a 17 year old, but I don't know. It's a very complicated issue. Yeah. We can, I sympathize with, with, I'm sorry, you know, you don't bring a child in this world with preconceived notions of what he or she will be. You, ha you have to yeah, deal, you deal have with to, it the yeah, best you can. You, you, you provide that loving, nurturing environment and you hope things work out to that. And there's always love and support there. I mean, but there's a lot of parents that don't get that. They just like, you know, oh, I'm going to have a child. This child's going to do this, 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 yeah, and this, yeah. and get married and have 3.5 children. And, and, you know, that's like, no, nah, that doesn't work out for good segment of society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, I'm glad to know that at least whether they want to or not the schools are having to mm -hmm. deal with this even if even if the parents don't want to <laughs> we're both lucky in that uh, we both have brothers who were heterosexual and they both provided children, grandchildren. So was that no burden pressure. was off yeah, of us. No pressure. Okay, that's a reality. And like, yeah, a lot of our friends who are single, who are only <laughs> children or, you know, I mean, yeah, there's that Where pressure. My grandchildren? Like, yeah. And, and that's reality. And, you know, and if you're the only, or both kids turn out to be gay, I mean, it's, it's something to be dealt with in the family. But yeah, my, we both have brothers that provided grandkids. So I have six nieces on my side. He has a, Niece, nephew, and niece and nephew and a grand and so and yeah. a great grandson yeah, yeah. so yeah. we're uh, we're we're lucky that way so but uh, but we definitely my yeah even though we had chose we I, I especially as an educate children I, I guess I get my nourishment from my job working in elementary school but uh, and he works with the kids all the time at the public library okay. but uh, but yeah but we certainly are proud and grateful for our friends that choose to have families but uh, yeah it wasn't necessarily a car for us and I'd say it's probably true for the majority. I'm curious what the numbers are for that, but I'd say probably at least 75% of LGBT couples probably never choose to raise children themselves. Uh, the yeah, the younger yeah. ones coming along yeah, are probably more children. likely to have children yeah. than people of our generations probably. But if if our generation had children, in, in most cases, it's because they, they did. Were they were, yeah, they were married in the previous and didn't come out. And they had a child from, and then so they're sort of like co-parenting a, a child from another marriage or something. So in most cases. But we do have, we have one good set of friends who did surrogacy. Uh, he had his child with a Panamanian woman in Panama. Uh, he didn't have the money to do it in the U.S. because it's very expensive to do that. I, what I, this was 10 years ago, but I was told it was a minimum of $100,000 to do it in the U.S. But in Panama, it was half of that. You could do it for 50000 So he chose to have a child uh, uh, with a Panamanian woman uh, surrogate. And so we know of that. And then we've known several couples who have adopted children. And uh, and have had that, but uh, but yeah, most of our friends choose like us to to not not uh, do that. So I don't know. Well, is there anything we didn't cover that you would like to talk about? <laughs> we covered a lot, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't. It's it's uh, it's been a ble I've, I've reflected a lot. I mean, it's hard to believe it's been seventeen years since all these groups. I mean, it just seemed like it wasn't that long ago. Like I was coming over to Winston and and exploring this life, and um, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing, especially the first ten years. Just like it, 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 it's hard to describe. But what it was for me was probably what like what like 
I'll never forget those first few years, one of my first dates and stuff and everything. I was like, I was like a, probably like a, a stereotype of ninth grade girl to be like, you know, like, oh my God, I got a date this Friday night, you know, like dancing around the house and everything. And, it, you know, you just got so alive. When you're 36. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's weird. Yeah, that's what's so weird. I was like, you know, here I am, a 36-year-old man, but I'm acting like a 15-year-old juvenile. Yeah, it's like, you know. yeah, it's like you went through your, well, that's ad, your adolescence right. very late. Yeah, because, you know, that, that everything was just so real. I mean, I, yeah, I remember I used to get so upset at, you know, the, like little decisions that men's course would make. And it's like, oh, I can't, and I'm just being so upset about the things I wouldn't even think about now. But it's because everything was so new and raw to me. And, and, and I was like, yeah, you went through your high school period all over again in those, in those, in those years. So, and I mind, and I had to remind so much cause like we ended up making friends with, I, I remember we made friends with this one couple who was younger and uh, they're both, um, and they were wonderful guys but one of them was a little overzealous and passionate and it was bothering my other friends like gosh so and so he's like he he just drives us crazy now i said well, cut him some slack i said i don't know how when you came out how you came out but i remember i wasn't far from him 10 years ago i said he's 10 years younger than us and he's sort of going through what we what i went through you know and everything's sort of larger than life and you take your emotions are just so out there and i said he's gonna have to go through that process too of, you know maturing and overcome the disappointment so um so that was weird to to have gone through those emotions at that late point in my life that a lot of heterosexuals wouldn't necessarily you know they, they've been there and done that by that point in time but uh um but yeah I, I don't look back at any regrets i just uh I say and that's not the case. I say a lot of a lot of my friends felt like they threw away their youth when they came out late, or else they did come out early, but then they dealt with the grief grief of AIDS and the struggle of that, and you know, are they are they just are bitter about you know the choices they made in parent and spouses or whatever, and and, and so there there's a lot. I know a lot of friends that have a lot of major regrets, but that's uh, not the case for me. I mean, I, I was in one failed relationship that. I was a little abusive in some ways, and uh, and but I learned from it. But yeah, I don't necessarily regret having gone through it, but it didn't work out. And mm -hmm. had we probably had marriage at the time, I probably would have been married to that person and had been through a divorce. But uh, well, I guess uh, and that and I had and we had a few gay, uh, and I think when there are some gays that don't support marriage, and I think that's the reason what they don't is because there it's an easy out for them not to have to be pressured to get married or something. And I, I tell those few, I was like, you know what? It may not be for you to be married. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, gays, you know, there are some of us, I think most of us tend to want to have a monogamous relationship, no different from heterosexual. But, like, there are some heterosexual swing couples, for sure, that's in the gay culture, too. And I said, you know, maybe it's not in, in your cards to be married and stuff like that, but you should fight and want it even harder for your gay friends that want marriage yeah. and want the and, marriage and rights. And I always feel that way. Yeah. For the rest of your life yourself. Too, right. so. And the, and the 1,135 rights that you get as a gay person, you know, just, uh, um, what's the HBO movie with Vanessa Redgrave that really illustrated that? If These Walls Could Talk, or it was about 10, 12 years ago with Vanessa Redgrave. It was a little, um, I think it was If These Walls Could Talk. But anyway, Vanessa Redgrave played this spouse. She was with this lesbian lover. They were together like 45 years. And then the spouse died. And yeah, the family just came in and just, just took the entire house over. She had no right. I mean, there was no will. She had no rights or anything. They weren't legally married. And yeah, these these cousins and nephews and nieces just came in and just took the whole house and took away these possessions that they had. I mean, it was so wonderfully, it was a stark reminder of why gay marriage is an important right. I mean, you know, you know that's something that a heterosexual couple would have to, wouldn't have to worry about or have to suffer uh, the indignity of. But uh, that was a reality. That was a big reality back for marriage was allowed yeah that's for sure but uh uh yeah i mean i'm grateful i say we've done a lot of work the progress we've made the past 17 years has been amazing i think we've turned a lot of hearts i'm very optimistic that we've turned a lot and it's going to keep getting better but right now we're sort of politically we feel like we're in a backslide and it has been very dis disappointing and depressing James is a history major, and he's explained it well to me that, you know, it's pretty typical in history. I mean, when you get a real quick, aggressive push for liberalism stuff, there's usually a push back. Yeah. And, you know, that's sort of how Hitler came into power, you know, uh, from out of World War One. And he's great at explaining all that to me. And uh, and we're, I think we're seeing that happen now because I think, you know, the gay marriage thing sort of just came out overnight. And and grabbed a lot of people by the throat and I think there's been some push what we're seeing the pushback from that. For sure. Yeah, and so 
I guess hopefully we'll, we'll sort of get it ironed out and then keep moving forward again. So we'll see. But um, but yeah, I, I just I, 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 I'm impatient for my spiritual journey. I'm just I'm trying to figure. I'm working, seeing if I'm going to get back to church soon, and and seeing where that's going to go. I, as each Sunday goes by, I feel a little more. I don't know. I just uh, I told. I told James, I said, in my ideal world, I just about, I just about always like to visit a new church every Sunday because I go, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a very boisterous singer, and every, and I go and, and when I'm like singing a hymn choir, everybody comes up and like, oh, you're such a wonderful singer, oh, you need to come join our choir. It's like it's such a love fest. I was like, thank you, that's very kind of you. I appreciate that. I will uh, see uh, you have a lovely church here. I told James, it's like. It's like, I, I, it's just wonderful just to experience that yeah. and, and just move on. I'm like, because it's when you actually decide, now, yeah, okay, I'll, and then you, then all the problems come, like being Googled and yeah. everything like that. And it's like, so it's sort of, but yet, you know, you can only drive to so many churches in a reasonable distance from your own. So, so yeah, I've, I've visited probably 20, 25 uh, in the area. And, uh, and, it's, and I say the story's been about the same. Their congregations have shrunk to, third their size or no kids there very you know just it's the only churches the only church i've seen grow was green green street almost died in downtown winston because of the flight to the suburbs and yeah that used to be a big church a nice sizable church and they used to have like three or four hundred every sunday and they were down to like 29 or something like in the mid 90s because everybody fled the neighborhoods and stuff all the the, the gates were there working they'll re re getting those arts and craft bungalows built back up. Steve lived there for a long time. And they started reaching out to them. And yeah, today, Green Street is a flourishing church of 250 people. They have like 50 or 60 LGBT couples and then a lot of heterosexual couples. And that church is flourishing. I know of another country church that has, we accept regardless of sexual orientation, they're very open and very honest. They're doing fine. They have a great children's choir, 20-some kids. And they have, uh, you know, they're, they're doing, they're doing, they're doing great. But yeah, the churches I see struggling are these closed minded churches that, you know, it's like, no, we're not going to do this gay thing, whatever. And that's, yeah, the kids don't want to, even, even they're straight heterosexual kids, they don't want any part of that kind of hate talk. And so they're, they've left. And yeah, that's, that's the same story over and over again. So, and that at some point in time, it's going to have to be reconciled. But I don't, I think some people would rather see the door, the doors of the church shut and closed down and sold than to, change and be open to a group that they think is a sinful being. I don't know. I'm just, uh, I just, uh, well, I'm, I'm very grateful for this journey that I've been on the last 20 odd years now. And when I started it and was just coming out, I couldn't imagine that eventually I'd be able to get, get married. <laughs> yeah. That was not on my radar. I just assumed I would never be able to get married. I, I hoped at some point I'd fall in love with somebody, but well, that's why I planned to wait. I said, I don't know what I'd marry. I might end up walking down the walk of the <laughs> aisle with a dog, but uh, a little, literally a pet or something. But I just like, like uh, I was like, no, I'm, but yeah, I don't know. I met James and it just sort of all fell. It, it just sort of, sort of fell into, um, uh, it just sort of all just sort of just naturally fell into place. We, after the marriage got passed, we started talking about it. So like, well, I guess we ought to look at getting married and things. And, I'm accused of not being very romantic sometimes, but I did do a great engagement announcement uh, proposal. I'll say that uh, um, how we proposed was that we both love movies. I mentioned going to the Aperture, and we yeah we go to a lot of movies. And we'll, and my friend Rex, uh, he does out of, he started out at the movies, and that was once a month at we School had of the Arts. At School of the Arts was a big they 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 do an LGBT film for us to go see. And we've been to quite a few of those. And and so, yeah, when I told you, so I knew I'm about to try to pick out our, you know, size rings. So we went, picked out our rings together. But I told him, I said, oh, they got your size wrong. They're going to have to, you know, the ring's not back yet and stuff. And he believed that because he's got uh, an unusually slender <laughs> finger. So he's like, ah, yeah, it makes sense or something. He didn't, he didn't question that. Well, I know I actually had the rings, but I thought, ah, well, that's a special way I can propose with these rings. So I called uh, my friend Rex. I said, I said, when, at the May, out at the movies, uh, do you think it'd be okay if, if, like, halfway through the screen credits at the end, would could you get the projectionist to interrupt and put James, Will You Marry Me, Dirk, on the screen? He said, oh, that's a great idea. He said, yeah, we can get that. We can make that happen. So we got, uh, he, did, he, he didn't catch on. Well, that's about 20, I told a few of our close friends, like, don't tell James this, but I'm going to propose to him at the movies this Saturday with the screen and everything. And, yeah, we had about... 15 or 18 that normally maybe wouldn't come that made a point to be there just to see that we enjoyed filming everything and um 
yeah, about a minute into the closing credits, all of a sudden it came to screen and then it just said James. And his first thought was like, did somebody in the movie die named James? And, like, it said, uh, in memory, the glory, and then it said, will you marry me, Dirk, on it. And he's like, he just started bawling. It was really, I mean, I forget, there's pictures in the, in, the, the, in the book about it. And, yeah, a lot of people said nice things on Facebook. People posted it and... Yeah, it was a nice, propo- a nice proposal, and it went well. And I told my friend Bud, uh, Bud about it and stuff, and Bud said, did he say yes? I said, well, of course he said yes. Do you think <laughs> I'd have proposed in front of God and everybody if I thought I was going to get a no? <laughs> but that is the reality. I mean, you know, you hear stories sometimes like people uh, engage in jump trial, and the, the wife, you know, the lady goes, oh, okay. You know, I was like, uh-oh, this didn't go like he thought it would, but yeah, but nah. Uh, that's just how public's the way I roll on that. It's sort of weird, even though I'm not into PDA that much or something in public. I, I was willing to do that kind of, but I was at our own little game film, so it wasn't really the same like a regular movie house, which you couldn't do. But uh, but uh, it was still nice. It was great, and so yeah, it's been a blessing. Uh, uh, I, know, I think we both chose right for each other, and uh, we we just hope uh, every couple can have what we have because uh, yeah, we we have a have a really great relationship and never had a fight and we pretty much know of course I guess at, at, at our age uh, um, you, know, so, you know you sort of know what you want and we talked all that out and like you know cause, and so we're like we sort of have the same goals in common that need to be held in common but yeah we have our own differences too and yeah, he thinks I'm a whirling dervish and he lets me go do my thing sometimes at all these groups and like bowling league and stuff and he's very kind to let me go do that so so uh, it works out great for both of us, but uh, but yeah, we really appreciate this opportunity to share. We probably went way longer than we should, but uh, but uh, but again, um, you know, we I guess we had a lot to offer in many ways, but but uh, I'll recommend after stop the, if you want to talk to other friends like that were together like the eighties and nineties here that might could offer even more insight. You know, back then what it was like specifically similar to some of the stories that we shared that were told to us. So, but. Um, yeah, it's 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 been um it's been a great great journey and and uh, we're very grateful for life and we're very grateful for our allies. Let me close with this: uh, we're very grateful for our allies that uh, support us. I mean, we couldn't do it without them, you know, obviously, um, to get the vote and support marriage men. But probably the the biggest, the most proud moment I was through that whole pride process was we threw a June, um, we threw a June uh, gay bingo. And um, eight eight straight brides decided they would put on their wedding dresses and march down the streets of Winston um, to support. Uh, they carried signs like, you know, uh, all for gay marriage, straight brides for gay marriage. And they had it on the front page. And when some journal, I got it, cut it, put it in my scrapbook. I cried when I read that. And it was like, that was so amazing. But the quote I'll never forget was that like I talk about like if we held hands go down the street you'd hear things and yeah they got shouted at when I was, they prayed down to the city center where we did the June Gay Bingo and um, they went by the Mel, Mel Mushroom some of one of the restaurants with outdoor seating and and uh, somebody held us like why do y'all care about gay marriage like if you're straight brides why do you care about that why are you in our face about that and she said she said gay marriage is not a gay quality right not gay rights. Uh, gay marriage is a human rights issue. It's not a gay rights issue. It's a human rights issue. And I just thought, what a wonderful, wise um, awareness she had of that. And, and yeah, it was quickly backed up by Hillary Clinton and others, you know, and, and, and I was to fight for that. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a human rights issue. And, uh, and I did speak out at a rally. We did, uh, uh, the men's course did do a rally for the bathroom bill when that was going on, and we were very angry about that. And uh, we went to a rally and sang, and um, and William asked me to take. And I said the, I said the same thing. I stole her line. I said, I said, you know, the trans. I said this bathroom issue. It's not a transgendered issue. This is a human rights issue, and um, and that's what it's all about. And yeah, without the support of our allies being aware of that, I mean, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Mm-hmm. So we're certainly grateful for that too. So and try try to never forget that. So. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for talking to us today. Yeah, it was our pleasure. Oh, <sighs> but um, so yeah, if um, 